Dear church, a warm word of welcome. It is still Easter here. And so remembering that this is the Queen of Seasons, seven Sundays of especially celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. Christ is risen. Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as your children, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever, and God's people say, Amen. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, with joy we celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection. By the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from Acts. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned land, lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Word of God, word of life.
reading from 1 John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that you also may have communion with us. And truly our communion is with the Father and with Jesus Christ the Son. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from Jesus Christ and proclaim to you, that God is light and in God there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have communion with God while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have communion with one another, and the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar, and God's word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Word of God, word of life. Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Judeans. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, also called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated and let me invite the young people of the congregation to come forward and meet Miss Angie up front.
How's everyone doing? Good. Good. All right. Well, would you believe it if I told you I was holding $20 in my hand? No? All right. Um, what could I do to make you believe that I was holding $20 in my hand? Yes. Pretend. Okay, I could pretend, but how would you know if I was really holding $20? Yeah. Uh, what could I do to prove it? To prove it, you could cut out a rectangle, then draw a pointy. Okay. So you're thinking I wouldn't get it out of my wallet. What if I told you I got it out of my husband's wallet? Would you believe that I have $20 now? Yes. Oh, to prove it, I could open my hands. Oh, $20. Now, that, there's a phrase called seeing is believing. Have you ever heard of that phrase? Yeah, you have to see it to believe it. Well, one of the disciples named Thomas, he had to see it to believe it too. So let's find out what happened in the story. Slam went the door, click went the lock. No one is coming in and no one is going out. The disciples were hiding in a house and they were afraid. Jesus died on the cross. Would they be killed too? Suddenly, Jesus appeared in the locked room with them. Peace be with you, said Jesus. The disciples stared. Their mouths dropped open. Could it really be Jesus? Jesus smiled. He showed them his hands. They saw holes from the nails. They knew it was Jesus. Now one of the disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus appeared to them. When the disciples told Thomas that they had seen Jesus, he didn't believe them. Thomas saw Jesus crucified and buried. How could he be alive? Thomas said, unless, unless I see Jesus and touch his hands, I'm not going to believe it. One week later, all of Jesus' disciples were back in the house, even Thomas. Suddenly, Jesus appeared again. Peace be with you, he said. Thomas, touch my hands, believe. Thomas fell on his knees and said, my Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, yet believe. Now I have a couple questions for you. How many of you believe in Jesus? Raise your hand, raise it up high. Yes, now, how many of you have seen Jesus in person? Raise your hand. Yeah, I haven't seen him in person either. Now we have a word that describes believing without seeing. Do you know what that word is? I'll give you a clue, it starts with an F. Faith, Faith. good job, yes. So now the words Jesus spoke to Thomas, they are true for us too. We are the ones that Jesus meant when he said, blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. All right, so why don't we fold our hands and we can have our closing prayer. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Thank you for the Bible filled with your love and promises. Thank you for the Bible filled with your love and promises. Thank you for our families, friends, and church who share your love. Thank you for our families, friends, and church who share your love. Thank you for living in our hearts, Jesus. Thank you for living in our hearts, Jesus. All of this helps us to believe without seeing. All of this helps us to believe without seeing. Amen. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. Thanks. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our living Savior, Jesus. Amen. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Amen. So a few questions. Who really shot JFK? Were the moon landings 
real or were they staged? Did Elvis really die in 1977? Or did he just stage it all so he'd get some privacy? How about Paul McCartney? There were rumors that he actually was killed in 1966 and a lookalike replaced him. Was 9-11 staged by the American government? And the questions go on. They might sound a little crazy to us right now, but maybe it depends upon the thickness of your tinfoil hat. <laughs> Americans, that includes all of us, seem to love good conspiracy theories. And our weakness for paranoid fantasies is actually embedded in our history from the very beginning. Some historians claim that the founders wrote the Declaration of Independence because they were fearful that Britain was about to enslave the colonists. And uh, you can go online and find so many conspiracy theories and different ideas. The 21st century has seen a rise in conspiratorial thinking, and the internet, of course, has been the unfiltered clearinghouse and megaphone for all of these. Um, these uh, theorists, conspiracy theorists, uh, sometimes called truthers, continually look for new information to explain what really happened. Conspiracy theorists have a reputation for being a little off base, and all of us are more likely to look for and receive and believe information that already agrees with our biases, right? But the truth is that we do always need people who are looking for the truth. When it comes to the most famous death in history, the death of Jesus Christ, conspiracy theories abound. But at the center of the story today from our gospel reading, we see someone who is really trying to get at the truth. And this figure is no outsider, but one of Jesus' own 12 disciples, Thomas. Shall we call Thomas a truther? The death and resurrection of Jesus have long been the target of conspiracy theorists trying to explain it away. The general tenor of these theories is that the disciples acted in concert to, um, to claim that Jesus was alive when he really wasn't, that he died and the disciples helped him come back alive again. And why would they do that, though? I mean, seems like that's the more elusive question. What would they gain from it? Some theorists, for example, speculate that Jesus didn't actually die, but he just sort of swooned on the cross. And eventually, he staggered out of the tomb. But there are just a few problems with that theory. Namely, the Romans were really good at industrial application of death to anyone they perceived an enemy of the state. The Roman soldiers are there, and they are veterans of killing. They recognize death and none of the folks that they have been ordered to execute are getting out of there alive. John also tells us that Jesus was stabbed with a spear. That would be kind of difficult to fake a swoon. There are other conspiracy theories related to the death and resurrection of Jesus. That somebody took the body of Jesus and then claimed he was alive. Matthew records that in his gospel that the chief priests followed that line of thinking. Some speculate that the disciples had a mass hallucination of Jesus after his death that was caused by their severe grief. Or some say they just saw a ghost. But despite 2,000 years of conspiratorial theories about the death and resurrection of Jesus, they have never been able to disprove it. And the resurrection stands. And it seems as if all of the Gospels, and especially here in John, the response to those conspiratorial theories is right there in front of us. And one of the places we see it most is clearly in this account of John. After the death of Jesus, the disciples are hiding behind locked doors in fear of the religious leaders. They have just heard from Mary Magdalene that morning that she had seen the Lord 
but they probably easily dismissed the words as fake news because women were not considered reliable witnesses in a court of law in the first century. Perhaps they chalked it up to some female hysteria. Sorry, ladies, I just report what the historians write. <laughs> but then, suddenly, Jesus appears among them with the greeting, peace be with you. So when we share the peace, don't miss the fact you are sharing the words of Jesus, right? And then he shows them evidence of the wounds in his hands, his side. It's a strange combination. Jesus is risen in a physical body, yet he can also appear through locked doors. It's clear that this is a different kind of body, but a body nonetheless. The disciples rejoiced after seeing the evidence. Mary's testimony had been confirmed. All of this happens without Thomas being present. When the others tell him, we have seen the Lord, the same testimony that Mary gave, he is not going to take their word for it. He is thinking that perhaps there is some kind of conspiratorial theory happening that his disciple friends are pulling on him. And after all, they had the benefit of seeing the nail marks. Why shouldn't he? Thomas may have thought his friends were engaged in that little collective conspiracy theory, and he was going to bust it. But we know that Thomas was a thinker, a questioner. Back in chapter 14 in John, when Jesus says he's going away and everybody's troubled and confused, Thomas is the one who speaks up and says, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. Maybe instead of calling him Doubting Thomas, we could call him Inquisitive Thomas. And then back in chapter 11 of John's Gospel, Jesus has told them that he is going to Jerusalem and has predicted his suffering and death. And Thomas boldly speaks up and says, we will go with you. And he is willing to die with Jesus. So maybe instead of calling him Doubting Thomas, we ought to call him Brave Thomas, right? Committed Thomas. Well, but in this instance, which we have grabbed onto, I think because we relate to Thomas so well, he wasn't going to buy into any kind of fake news. He wouldn't sell his own life cheaply based on false inf information or speculation. And then Thomas has the opportunity. Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. Notice Jesus never calls Thomas a doubter. And in a sense, all the disciples were doubters, weren't they? Their doubt was only suspended when they saw Jesus alive in their own eyes. Thomas, of course, responds to Jesus with that powerful confession, my Lord and my God. Powerful words. It's a confession of faith. Notice that John doesn't tell us that Thomas takes Jesus up on his offer and actually touches his wounds. We don't know. But it seems that just the presence of Jesus is finally enough for Thomas. And what John implies very powerfully is that the presence of Jesus should be enough also for us. You have believed because you have seen me, says Jesus. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. John is speaking to his audience there, but also he is speaking to future generations, to us, uh, to talk about the truth of the gospel. He is giving us the evidence and asking us to believe it, but not just on the basis of the evidence of itself. He wants us to believe also because the Holy Spirit, given to us, continues to act as a witness to the resurrection and the ongoing presence of Jesus with us right now, here. It's not that the evidence is unimportant and that this is just a leap of faith. Quite the contrary. The evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is quite compelling from a historical perspective. If you were going to make up a story to impress others in the first century about a death and resurrection, the way it's described in the Gospels is totally not the way to do it. 
which lends a great deal of veracity, I believe. First of all, you wouldn't have women be the original witnesses. Already mentioned that, right? Next, the Greco-Roman world felt that it was important that the soul, which was immortal, they believed that, be freed from the confines of the body. So why would anybody want to raise up a physical body again and entrap the soul? They just wouldn't have bought that. And for Jewish folks, there's a verse in the Hebrew scriptures that says anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed. Surely this couldn't be the Messiah who is cursed and hangs on a tree. That would be like saying, I've seen a UFO, get the tinfoil hat, right? And all of that, I trust for us who have the Holy Spirit present in our heart and the witness of the community of faith through the centuries are able to say, yes, Christ is indeed risen. It was possible that a large body of people, for Paul will tell us later, and we'll hear that in the weeks ahead, that some 500 people saw Jesus. And there, in spite of all kinds of efforts to quiet the disciples, they wouldn't shut up about it. Charles Colson, some of you might remember him. He was one of the Watergate conspirators. That was a real conspiracy, by the way. He was known, he was the special counsel for President Richard Nixon and uh, was also known as the hatchet man for President Richard Nixon. And of course, he was indicted and convicted and spent seven years uh, in prison. And while in prison, he became, he had a religious experience was converted and became a faithful Christian. And he describes it, I think his words fit this scripture well. I know the resurrection is a fact. The Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for over 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Impossible. We have the eyewitness testimony of the Gospels the evidence of the early church's growth and how profoundly people were changed. We also have the witness of centuries of Christians transformed and living in faith. But most importantly, Jesus says to us, receive the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is still witnessing that Christ is alive. John wrote his gospel not only to give us evidence for Christ, but to bring us to faith in Christ. As he puts it later in the text, but these things are written so you might come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Ultimately, dear church, our belief in the resurrection of Jesus is a matter of faith, backed by evidence. When we believe, we begin to see all that God has done, all that God has made possible through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And when we live out that belief, that's when we become living examples and witnesses of the resurrection, proving that the gospel is more than a conspiracy theory or any theory. It is indeed truth for the truthers for Christ is alive. The resurrection, it's a way of life, and it's a way to life. Christ is risen, alleluia. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. And now, may the peace of God that far surpasses our understanding keep our minds and hearts in faith in Jesus. Amen.
We join our hearts as we confess our faith using the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. On this second Sunday of Easter, let us pray for the church, the earth, and all those in need, responding to, with, to each petition with words that echo today's second reading. Give us communion with you. Your church cries out to you, O God. As you, dwell, as you drew near to the disciples, draw near to the church throughout the globe. Bless bishops and clergy for their difficult tasks of ministry. God of grace, give us communion with you. Your creation cries out to you, O God. O nurture trees, crops, wildflowers, and all growing things. Keep safe all who travel to see the solar eclipse and grant them a sense of your majesty in creating the universe. God of grace, give us communion with you. Your world cries out to you, O God. Bring an end to war and violence. Attend to those who suffer from tornadoes, earthquakes, and other natural disasters. Visit, we beg you, the people of Gaza, and protect aid workers and first responders in their work of rescue. Shield those who live in war zones and assist our national leaders in their efforts towards international peace. God of grace, give us communion with you. Your children cry out to you, O God. Hear your people crying out for justice and for an end to prejudice and other oppression. Make us advocates for all whose voice is not heard. We pray for those out of work in Baltimore and for all who cry out in suffering or, in, or pain, especially for those names we call out to you here. God of grace, Give us all humans cry out to you, O God. Comfort all who mourn the death of loved ones and accompany those all who await their own death. Accept our gratitude, O God, for the lives of those who, along with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, have gone before us in the faith. Receive our faith, accept our doubt, and grant us peace. God of grace, Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. And the words of Jesus, right? Peace be with you. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share the peace of Christ.
Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts towards those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care, and prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Passover Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin who in dying has destroyed death and in his rising has brought to us eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering therefore his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and to be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church now and forever. Amen, amen, amen. 
Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Come.
invite you to stand. Now may the body and the blood of our Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in true faith to life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to your son's resurrection, that we may show your glory to all the world, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for announcements. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, lots of stuff to talk about today, so it's very exciting. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce everybody to our new church administrator, Dale Heidebrecht. He's standing up in front here. He'll wave. Yay. So <laughs> give a warm welcome to him and his wife. Um, and they are worshiping with us today and will be at coffee hour downstairs if you want to come and say hi but he, he's in the church office every day. So if you want to come by and say hi, then do. Uh, but it's certainly if you need any assistance with administrative stuff, um, he is your go-to contact now. Uh, starting this Wednesday, we're doing a weekly, or rather the pastor is doing a weekly uh, series on a tour of the Holy Land. So we hope you can join starting Wednesday at seven in the parish hall. And I believe it'll be three sessions. Um, two in April and one in May. Uh, and then also starting next week, we'll be collecting for personal care kits. So look for more details on that in our written announcements coming this coming week, but that'll also be during uh, Sundays, the rest of the Sundays in April. Uh, and we're looking to do a volunteer fair in two weeks, April 21st. So plans are still coming together on that, but we hope that everybody can join uh, to learn about more opportunities to support our work here at Resurrection. Uh, and then for the last Sunday in April the 28th, uh, the Earth Sunday, we're planning a couple of things, I think, um, but most importantly, our stormwater education uh, session. So I hope you can join for that. And then in May, May 18th, our Re Music and Resurrection series continues with the Carmina and Illuminare Choir. So hope you can join for that. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.
in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.